thank you very much. I'm really honored for this invitation to come. And so I'm going to say a number of things uh, today probably that, um, that may raise questions in your mind. And if we don't, I'm perfectly happy to answer any question to the extent possible. But if you have additional questions or want additional information um, or want a paper that I mentioned or something like that, this is my email address. And I know it's hard to see from the back, but it's just buffington dot and then the number one and then the at symbol, and then osu.edu. Okay, and I'm pretty good at responding to email. Okay. So um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about nutrition because I know more about, I know, I'm a lot better trained in nutrition than I am in behavior. So I'm incompetent in behavior, I'll, I'll, and I'll demonstrate that amply over the time that we're talking together. Um, but, but I have every degree you can get in nutrition. Um, postdoctoral fellowship in human nutrition. I'm a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Nutrition. And then, thank God, OSU offered me a job or I'd still be a student at Davis. <laughs> so uh, so that, was a happy, uh, that was a happy occasion. And so I'm going to um, talk about just a few things that I'm kind of interested about nutrition from, from a veterinary nutrition point of view, and which may be somewhat different. And some of what I'm going to show is what I show veterinarians so you have some idea maybe about what the things that we think about that may impact you. And, and of course, there are some very interesting overlaps of, uh, um, of nutrition and behavior. And I'll try to point up a couple of those as we go along. Okay. So, so to start out, as it, just, to, just so you can all be uh, 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 <coughs> inducted into the nutrition uh, uh, um, fraternity, sorority, whatever, um, if you don't know anything about nutrition, it's how to do a nutrition history. And this is, the, this is actually the logo of the American College of Veterinary Nutrition. And the idea is that anytime you are asked to make a nutrition recommendation, the probability of you making a good recommendation, recommendation is directly proportional to your use of this picture. Right? <laughs> so memorize this picture. It's all you got to know. Okay? Because the first thing is, is that somebody says, what should I feed my pet? You know, and, and I don't know if you didn't know before, veterinarians are trained that you have to answer questions. You know? And unfortunately, we're not so well trained on how to answer the right questions. Okay? So when somebody says, what should I feed my animal? Well, we generally start talking about this, that, or the other thing. When the right thing to say is, I don't know, what kind of animal you got? Where does it live? What's it doing? You know? um, find out those kinds of things. And then, or one of my personal favorites, what do you think of this diet? I don't know. Who are you going to feed it to? How are you going to feed it? What, you know, tell me what else. Anyway, so that, and I'll talk about all of these things in, in a little more detail. And then one of the things that, that um, and I'll also demonstrate our ignorance of this, is that nutritionists don't do enough, is that, I mean, we, you know, we know veterinarians know a fair bit about animals. Nutritionists know a fair bit about diets. What we really don't think about is what the environmental factors are associated with nutrition as nutritionists. And by that, I mean, what does the, what's the owner want? It's an important question. What other animals are around? What's the story on the environment? And it's been my experience over, over, uh, 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 over my time as a, as a, clin as a clin veterinary clinical scientist is that these are probably more important, certainly than this, and often than this. Okay? So we need to think about And then, so you go through all that, and now you're sort of in a position to make a recommendation. <coughs> And then, uh, then you've got to go back around again to see if the recommendation you made led to the outcome you wanted. Okay? Right? And one of the reasons I'm a famous nutritionist is because I'm an academician and nobody ever comes back. <laughs> so I know all my recommendations are right because nobody ever came to tell me they were wrong. Or you get the idea. So anyway, it's one of the challenges uh, uh, actually of being in academic practice. And, and I'm assigned to, I, I am a clinical scientist, but I'm assigned to our community practice in the university. And so I tell everybody I'm a zoo animal, I'm a zoo animal veterinarian, right? Because all of the animals that I see are locked up in a cage called somebody's house. <laughs> and as soon as we start thinking about them like zoo animals, they look a whole lot different and, more, and our approach to them changes, I think, in helpful ways to them. So anyway, um, what else we got? So let's talk about cat. I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what I think about cats. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because you probably know most of it. Uh, anyway, cats are real carnivores. By that, I mean that they diverged into, car into carnivory in the phylloidia about 30 million years ago in the forests of Asia. Um, 
They are solitary hunters of small prey. They have you know, big teeth and a short GI tract. Um, <clears throat> they have some very interesting uh, physiological differences and metabolic differences in the way they handle nutrients that I'm not going to bore you with the details of unless you want to hear it some other time. Uh, anyway, but the, the thing about that, the, the, the summary of this is that it, 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 my conception is, is it seems to me that some clients and even some veterinarians think of cats as such a narrowly niched nutritional cripple that they can only get along on very, very particular things. Okay? Nothing could be further from the truth. Okay? Cats, as you probably know, live in the widest range of environments of any species except us. And how'd they get there? We took them. Exactly. You know? um, and they can eat anything from a purified diet, and I will show you what I mean, uh, mean by that, uh, to you know, chasing down something, killing it, and eating it. And of course, they are tuned to their situation by history, context, and expectation. And I'll define that for you, because that's all I know about behavior. Um, and I know there's veterinary behaviorists in the room, and I I'll just apologize from the start. But anyway. So this is what a purified diet looks like. Okay? I mean, probably none of you have ever worked on these. I did this for a living when I was a graduate student. So if cats are nutritional cripples and need particular things, we raise cats for multi-generations on this stuff, which looks and tastes like Play-Doh. Okay? You know, there's the National Research Council nutrient requirements of the cat and the dog. Those are established with an amino acid mixture, turkey fat, starch, sucrose, salt mixture, vitamin salt, which is uh, uh, all of this kind of stuff, uh, vitamin min uh, mineral mixture, and choline chloride. That was it. And cats thrived on it. Okay. So can cats be vegans? Yeah. We could have changed out the chicken fat. Do I recommend that to people? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. So if you've got a PhD in nutrition and you're studying nutrition, you can do it. But my only point is here is how adaptable they are as a species. Okay. Because what we really do when we have cats as pets is we test the limits of their adapt adaptive capacity. And I'll come back to that because someone said that animals are individuals and I want to talk about that. So since I'm talking about behavior a little bit, I thought I should give you my sort of simple-minded definition of behavior. And this is really the, it comes from the ABC definition in humans, um, but I'm going to start with B in that um, there's a behavior. So the, the animal acts, and you'll see that I like cycles too, because it's the second one you've seen already. I'm, and I'm a bicyclist, that's probably where it came from. But anyway, <laughs> so, so the animals act, and then the environment responds in some way. You know, so the cat nuzzles up against you and you pet it. So that's, you know, that's a behavior and a response. And then the animal, and this is the, the cast is everybody, um, learns from that response by the environment, okay? And by learn, I mean constructs a meaning from the afferent input from all the five senses. Okay? And so learning is really an emergent property of the nervous, of, of, uh, of the nervous system. And, oops, wrong way. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> and that learning is informed by that particular individual's history. And by history, I mean genetic, epigenetic, and environmental, its context, which means where it is at the time the interaction takes place, and its expectation, what's going to happen next. Okay? Trivial example, you're walking down the street at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's a bright sunny day, and you hear this sort of concussive sound next to you, and you think, hmm, car backfired. You're walking down the same street at 2 o'clock in the morning, it's pitch black, but, and you just staggered out of a bar after last call, you hear the same concussive sound, what do you think? Someone's shooting at me. Right? Context, expectation, okay? completely changes. And, um, and then all of this is integrated into a decision. And that's a, it's a pretty simple decision. And that decision is, should I approach or withdraw? Should I continue my present course of action or should I change course of action? And that's it. When you think about this in time, this happens about 50 times a second. It happens as soon as the nervous system becomes established in utero and it ends at death. So this is happening in all of us all of the time, outside of consciousness. So that's, I mean, so it was one of the things that's fascinating to me about behavior, because where I got into it was when do we withdraw? We withdraw in the presence of threat. And that's what I ended up working with was really threat. 
And it's not just threat, it is the perception of threat, and it is the integral output of the perception of control divided by the perception of threat. Because if you've got more control than you have threat, then you can cope. As soon as you have more threat, you know, it's, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil because I'm the biggest mu in the valley. <laughs> you know, okay? So you're okay in that situation, but when someone bigger comes along, that's a problem, okay? So that's sort of, that's sort of how I think about this. Um, and I just wanted to get that out of the way. So uh, a little comparison, we've, uh, dogs have been introduced. Some of you probably know about dogs. Um, I happen to like dogs a lot. Um, but anyway, I was, uh, oh, which I, I probably didn't mention that. I was born, I, I should tell you a little bit about my own background so you understand where I'm coming from. I was born on a cattle ranch in the Central Valley of California during the decade of the 1950s. At that time, cat and veterinarian would never have been used in the same sentence. It had nothing to do with each other, okay? And so I've been around animals for a long time and uh, like a lot of them. But anyway, uh, cats hold a different place on the food chain. All of our clients know that cats are predators. None of them know they're a prey species. And what they really don't know is that they're living with their two primary predators, which is their owner and the dog. <laughs> and, and they're locked up with them, right? So, oh boy. Anyway, um, their, their hunting habits are different. Cats are solitary hunters of small prey. And so other cats are competitors. I mean, you all know this. Um, where do, where uh, uh, um, larger carnivores and primates are group hunters of big prey. So, so dogs and people and, uh, uh, and the large prey species are also groups because of safety in numbers. And so cats are really in a niche there where they're a different, they have a different uh, background and behavioral structure which uh, I translate to my students by telling them, you know, you can slap your dog or slap your horse or slap your sweetie and they have some idea what you mean by that. You, you slap a cat, the cat just thinks you're trying to kill it. Because it doesn't know, it doesn't have that set. You've probably read the rest of this, the, the taste systems are different, their food preferences, cats are real carnivores, dogs are some, somewhere between carnivores and omnivores, their eating frequency uh, is, there's data all over the place on what meal frequency is in cats, and I think of them as opportunistic feeders. They'll eat whenever food's available. Because they're, because they're they, I mean, they came out of the forest hunting small prey. There's about 30 calories in a mouse. A large cat needs about 10 mice a day. Hunting's about 30% effective in most species, and so there you get, you know, needing to hunt once an hour to get fed, okay? So um, there are cats that kill rabbits. They tend not to eat a lot of them, but question. Can you repeat the question? No. <laughs> it's, actually an it's actually an excellent question. And that's one of the things I came here to find out because the honest answer is I don't know because it depends on the cat's history, context, and expectation, which is why I showed that. But the question is a really good one, is force, particularly in obesity therapy, is forcing an animal into a, a, a meal pattern that it's not used to threatening to it. And, 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 and I have no idea, but it sure seems to me like it could be. There's one of the, there's a, 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 a behaviorist who has, who has two really long names that I can't pronounce, but she wrote this nice book called The Cat Whisperer a couple of years ago. And she says that, that uh, not making animal, forcing animals into meal feeding works better for obesity therapy than not. I, I already told you I'm a nutritionist, so you know I'm an abject failure at obesity therapy which is why I'd like to make it a behavioral problem rather than a nutritional problem. <laughs> one of the reasons, the other one is because I think it is. So, so you see now, I don't know how to say, I don't know with grace and authority. <laughs> Question. Uh, it might be the same one as hers. I kind of lost you in all that. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm a pet sitter, so I, I don't have all the terminology down, but free feeding versus feeding them twice a day. Mm -hmm. Is that what your question was? Yes. Th yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, thank, no, thank you for that, because it's really easy to get stuck in jargon, and, and I'm really bad at it. So anytime I say something you don't understand, be sure to raise your, clarify it. What? So my answer is it depends. Yeah. There's, and that's the, that's the problem is, is that, and has been reiterated by many people here, is that it's, what's the history, what's the context, what's the expectation? What's going on in this animal? Okay, and I'll show you some other examples of that. Okay. 
Um, so you've read all of this. Uh, social value of meals. Um, what dogs. does that mean, the social value of meals? Oh, it means do you want to eat by yourself or somebody else? Yeah. So you could probably think of some other species that you might be able to replace dogs with, huh? Yeah. Okay, so a couple of things. I don't know how often you work in uh, uh, work with young kittens, but for me, talking to veterinarians, this is the most important place to work with nutrition and behavior. So young, uh, young kittens are better learners than older individuals. All animals can learn, no question about that. Very good evidence for that. But the... Uh, the <coughs> The maternal diet, maternal feeding behavior, all those things influence offspring in fairly fascinating ways. Um, in, in, uh, uh, during early life, providing some variety so that the cat doesn't become uh, fixated if they, if they do. Right? There's a little question on that, but anyway, it's nice to show them that there's different kinds of foods, um, both not, just, uh, not, uh, um, not just for the nutrients, but also for the hedonics, the mouthfeel and the smell and the taste and all of those kinds of things to broaden their palate, just like you do with little kids. Uh, food, of course, is used in training. I'll talk just a little tiny bit about that. Um, it is um, forced on um, uh, forced on adults. And then feeding for seniors, we don't have time to talk about that, but that's one of the more complicated areas of veterinary nutrition because geriatric diet is an oxymoron. And the problem with that is that, as you know, aging is a stochastic process. It's a random process. We all age at different rates and different times and have different organ sy systems uh, failures. And, deficiencies and uh, disease and all of that kind of thing. And so the diet for any, indiv any individual animal has to be tuned to that animal. Um, so that's that. We won't talk too much about it. Uh, just a little bit about nutrients, some things that have come up and some things that people, including veterinarians, maybe none of you do, but some veterinarians do that, uh, that I thought I'd mention just briefly. Uh, so some, there is this sort of hallucination that cats have some issue with water. And I think it came from, well, I, I, I think it came from a paper that came in the 40s by Adolf that showed, that, uh, that purported to show that cats were a little less sensitive to uh, dehydration than other species, uh, which was not the case when you looked at the data, but anyway. Um, but also part of it is that cats, as, as you all know, were, were uh, domesticated in the Levant about 10,000 years ago. The Levant now is a desert, and so everybody assumes they grew up in a desert. Well, A, the Levant was not a desert 10,000 years ago, and B, they didn't grow up there. So that's that. Or they've got really... <laughs> so, so they got really concentrated uh, ability. N nobody who knows anything about renal concentration mechanisms thinks that. Um, there's this issue about drinking and food, and well, cats, if you give them enough water uh, uh, in their food, they won't drink. Neither will we. So that's not very interesting. Um, what drives drinking is what's called, and this is a technical nutritional term that you don't need to know, the potential renal solute load, which means the mineral matter in the diet. And there's very good correlation between how much mineral is in the diet and how much animals drink, because what do you got to do? You got to get rid of it. Right? So, that, so none of this other stuff makes any sense. And when it's been, and, 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 uh, and when it's been studied, their total body water and, and water turnover not that much different from anybody else. So that's really a, a delusion. Um, what else? There's also often some discussion about how much, how much cats need. Question, please. Um, back to the water yeah. issue, uh, a common concern that's um, talked about a lot in the community is that cats can't, if they're drinking their water, it's not going into their system the same way as if they were eating the water in their food. Is that the mythology? Yeah, the, que the question was, do cats process water differently if they drink it as opposed to if it comes in in their food? Yeah. No. No, that is classified under silly. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> okay. Um, and, um, okay, so we yeah, have, thank you for that. Okay, so uh, I didn't mean you were silly. That's a good question. Okay, um, and so veterinarians tend to tend to like equations for some reason. I don't know. And 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 the more complicated the equation is, the more sometimes they seem to like it because it gives us the illusion of precision. Right? Do any of you use equations to estimate energy intake for animals? No. No. A couple of, couple of you do? Do you mind a question? What's the variance of the estimate? 
What's the range? If you give them a number, what's, it's plus or minus something. What is it? Anybody know? 50%. Wow. Right, so, you know, cats need 200 calories a day. Everybody knows that, right? What, what, but what it means is they need between 100 and 400. Yeah. And so that's a little complicated. And so we don't tend to use, well, I don't tend to use that. And I like to taunt my colleagues, because i got a few of them who just love these equations. Um, but anyway, that's that. So what we prefer to, what, what equations will do is they will get you into the zip code of the animal. Okay? But what we're talking about is individuals. So we want the address of that animal. And what we use for that is body condition score. Okay? And there are lots of body condition scores. There's lots of ways to measure body condition score. My preference is that the, I take the Goldilocks approach on a lot of things. This animal's either too skinny, too fat, or just right. Okay? I like to feel the, you know, I like to feel the ribs and talk to the clients while I'm doing that. And if I'm feeling the ribs and it feels like my knuckles like this, cat's too skinny. Okay? If I feel the ribs, it feels like the back of my hand, just about right. If I feel the ribs and it feels like the hypothenar muscle here, cat's too fat. Easy. Right? It's not rocket science. Nutrition, okay? <laughs> People can do that. Okay, and so, so we feed to a healthy weight, which means starting as soon as possible, because I want to teach the clients this, because we, you know, we talk about how important it is to teach kittens because their learning is best. Well, owners of new animals are at their most, uh, at their most receptive to learning, right? They just got this thing, they don't want to screw it up. I mean, they haven't found out what's going to happen, you know, and so you've still got some time with them. And as, vet, and, and as veterinarians, one of the nice things for us is, you know, we have this built-in vaccination schedule, so we can check over and over and over and reinforce positive behavior, reshape misdirected behavior, those kinds of things. And uh, we do that by praising the clients, which I'm sure you know, you know, as behaviors, we do it because they'll pay their bill when we are nice to them. Uh, so, but anyway, and so the general recommendation, and boy, is the evidence weak on this, but trust, well, yeah, just, so just send me an email if you want, if you don't believe me, is to feed to a body condition score, to a lean body condition score during the period of growth. Um, this is what I tell veterinarians, teach the owners how to do it, talk about it each visit. By preparing for neutering, one of the, there's, there's a half a dozen papers out now that show that if you don't manage animals' food intake after you neuter them, they will gain lots of weight, it'll all be fat, and you can't get it off. And so the suggestion has been that maybe we do a formal estimate of food intake before neutering and hold the animal at that food intake for a couple of weeks after neutering. That has not yet been tested, but needs to be. Um, oh yeah, I'm going to go through this really quickly. So most of you are probably familiar with this work already. This is the, the geometric analysis of macronutrient selection in the adult domestic cat, Felis catus. This is a, what, 12-page paper in the Journal of Experimental Biology that is, well, boy, if you got sleeping problems, you let me know. <laughs> I'll send you one of these, okay? But it's absolutely fascinating work, and I'm only going to point out a couple of little things. And that's that animals have macronutrient preferences. And so what they did, all these dots are different groups of animals that were offered choice between diets with different levels of fat, carbohydrate, and protein in them. Right? So the nutritionist, that's pretty interesting. And what they found was that cats left to their own devices will select a diet that's about 50% protein, about 35% fat, and about 15% carbohydrate, roughly. Those percentages are meaningless. When you translate them into intakes, it's about five grams per kilogram of cat per body weight per day, about two of fat, and about one and a half for carbohydrate. Question. How would those settings have controlled for proximity selection? Oh, why don't you come talk to me afterwards and I'll send you the pay and we can discuss it. We don't have time for that now. Thank you. That and I don't have a clue what you said. <laughs> uh, anyway, so give me time to learn. Or you can teach me and then, and then tell me. But I'll send you the paper. Um, others can tell you if it's a good question or not. So anyway, the reason I like that is because that's one set of studies done in, in one place. Another set of studies done by a completely different group, completely different place. The daily minimum protein requirement for adult cats appears to be at least 5.2 grams per kilogram body weight per day. Now again, this is, this is you know, young, healthy cats. And the difference is, is they, look, they compared nitrogen balance with lean muscle mass. And nitrogen balance is a stupid way nutritionists try to measure protein requirements that uh, is, doesn't work. 
And when you do it right, you find out about the same thing to sustain lean body mass. And then this is just a regression equation from uh, a review paper of obesity therapy in cats. And what you see is that, uh, and, and what happens here is this is protein intake. This is percent fat loss, not percent body, body weight loss. And what you see is there's a break point, you know, right around here somewhere, right around five grams per kilogram body weight of protein. So when you feed cats protein levels like that, they lose fat, but not lean muscle mass. And that's all fairly new. The challenge is, is that five, kilogram, uh, uh, five grams per kilogram, if you've got a four kilo cat, that's 20 grams a day. Cats, as I said, eat different amounts of food to maintain a healthy body weight. And so if you've got a cat that's only eating 150 calories, it needs a 50% 53, 50% protein dry diet, which are hard to find. Um, they exist, but they're hard to find. Or a canned diet that's got about 13% protein. That's just reading it off the label. Okay? So those are fairly high protein foods. And, and how this is gonna influence their behavior since it's part of their selection process, I think is quite an interesting question. So um, time will tell about that. And they need more when they get old, as do all species, as far as I'm aware, okay. um, because of inefficiencies in metabolism, mostly. Wait, so did you say that older animals need more protein? Yes. Okay. Which is the opposite of what most of our vets have been telling us? Well, they, and, and, that's, and, and, and that's because of what marketers have been telling, have been deluding them about. Okay. And that's why I said that, that uh, that's why I said that geriatric diets are an oxymoron. There are some old animals who do need protein restriction. Most don't. Yeah, good question. And, and that, that, that would be a whole hour talk, just that. Yeah. So anyway. Um, and so the interesting thing about most, most some, many of you, are, some of you hopefully, have heard there's this big debate in veterinary medicine about is there a carbo can cats get too much carbohydrate? The only reason I showed you this stuff about protein is it completely turns that debate around. Well, maybe it's not too much carbohydrate. Maybe it's not enough protein. And that is a testable hypothesis that has not yet been tested. Okay. So um, uh, time will tell about that. And the reason that we got worried about carbohydrate in, in the first place was about in, uh, altering the risk for type 2 diabetes, which of course came from a couple of epidemiologic studies. But there's also this ec epidemiologic study that shows it's not the diet, it's what? The environment. Okay. Which, which I always show because it feeds my prejudices. Okay. So, but I can send you the paper if you want to see it. Um, anyway, so that's that. Uh, what else we got? Uh, we'll just go on. Uh, oh, and one of the things, and I'm going to talk about this more uh, uh, after lunch, is that one of the things that we have missed as nutritionists up until the present moment is <coughs> about, uh, about weight, because obesity is thought to be a problem and type 2 diabetes is thought to uh, be a problem, is that problem may start with how mom was fed. And it turns out that if you limit intake in mom, what you'll do is rewire the offspring so that they are tuned to live in a nutrient-restricted environment. What a handy thing, huh? I'll tell you a little bit more about how that works because it's not just this that does it. Um, and it turns out that if you do that, and this is not, it's not a terribly good uh, figure, but anyway, if, if you do that and you live in a nutrient-restricted environment, your chances of survival are better. Right? So it's an evolutionarily conserved mechanism. If, it, if, by contrast, you end up being born into a land of plenty and your whole body is wired to keep every molecule of energy that you've got, you can't get rid of it. So now you're at risk for metabolic syndrome, for obesity, for diabetes. And so if this sounds defensive, it is. I think some of our failures as nutritionists um, to be able to treat obesity is because we're not thinking about developmental origins of health and disease. We're using an old model. And I'll share that with you this afternoon. Um, and, just, uh, and, and macrosomic just means when the baby's too big. But if the baby's too big or too small, you can get the same kind of outcome. And it turns out the, tr the therapy for this Behavioral. Okay. okay, diet. I'm going to talk about diet for just a minute. No, I, 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 and I'll tell you about that this afternoon. Okay, but you already know about it. I'm just going to put it in context for you. So I'm not going to say too much about diet, and probably not a lot. That, well, anyway. So first of all, my definition of a satisfactory diet 
It's one that is complete. It's got all the nutrients in it. It's balanced. They are there in proper proportions. It is digestible to the animal so the nutrients can get across the GI tract through the liver and into the body. The animal will eat enough to sustain itself. In my experience, that's not a problem. And that it's safe. And there are three aspects of safety. One is nutritional safety, which means that the diet does not induce a nutritional deficiency, toxicity, or imbalance in the animal. Second, there is toxicological safety, which means that there's no poison in it of some sort, and which happens occasionally. It's like plane cra planes crash occasionally, but anyway. Um, and then microbiological safety, that it's not contaminated with something. Okay? So that's it. And, um, and in the United States, if you go to a store and buy a food, I'll come to you in just a second, and, and, and buy a food uh, for a cat and feed it to the cat that's, that it was intended to be fed to, it's satisfactory. Yeah. Question. Well, cats are carnivores too, so why are we using anything other than what they're designed to eat? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. So you're talking about diet designed to eat, or they are carnivores. Yeah. Well, remember I was talking about what their adaptive capacity was? That's where you get into mischiefs. You test their adaptive capacity. Because if you say an animal is one thing and it, it implies, what, what I heard is that, the, so the question is if they're carnivores, can't you just feed them meat? Well, that, because an animal's a carnivore doesn't imply that it can't eat anything else. Huge difference. Because, because, and, and they can, well, I showed you the preference on a slide just a minute ago. So we can talk about that afterwards if, if you like. So, yeah, go ahead. So why do vets feed pills or prescribe the pill science diet to treat specific ailments? Yes. Yeah. Well, there, were there other brands where healthier at all added unneeded pills? Let's take that up at the end if we have time, or I can talk to you about it afterwards. Because yeah. the situation is far more complex than that. I said the situation is, is, is the situation is so much more complex than that. They would take me the rest of my time just to explain that the answer to that question. Right. Um, okay, so people got this. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of discussion about ingredient lists. Some of you may have heard that. Okay. Well. My view is that the emphasis on ingredients is inversely proportional to the individual's knowledge of nutrition. Because there is no ingredient needed by any animal. None, unless you count water, and that's sort of a special case. Animals need nutrients, which are contained in ingredients. Okay? And the reason that ingredients are worthless uh, is that you don't know what it is. So companies that sell dry cat foods, where our first ingredient is real chicken, means that it's 62% water, so it would go down to the middle of the ingredient list. And real chicken really means mechanically deboned chicken, which is the, the uh, synonym for which is white slime. And so, why, you know, so they could put our first ingredient is white slime. Now, as a nutritionist, I go, OK, that's fine. I'm not sure people would buy it, OK, right? And so you don't know what it is. You don't know if it's good white slime or bad white slime. Okay? You don't know where it came from. Right? You don't know how much of it is there, and you don't know how, much, how it affects the balance of the other ones. And the only thing it tells you is that the manufacturer is trying to manipulate your emotions by words it adds to the label, because that's their primary method of communication with clients. Okay? Please. So a lot of them are using corn as their first nutrition. So what? That is completely bogus. No, of course it's digestible. You give, a cat, you give a cat dry whole corn and they won't, but I can give it to you and it'll come out just like it would in the cat. That's not how it's used. Okay. So, <laughs> anyway, got another question. I was going to say, this is what we always look at in our practice. When cats are out of the wild and they eat a mouse, they eat the entrails, which are full of grains and seeds, corn. Right. Pre digested. So, yeah. Fair enough. Okay. What? Where does that put a raw diet into this section versus other diet? I think it, 
that's another question I'd like to set aside because, because it depends on your definition of a raw diet. And, and you, can, you can buy raw diets that by AFCO feeding trials, complete and balanced for all life stages of, for both dogs and cats. And then some people just think you can feed raw hamburger. And so without going through the whole circle of nutrition to find out all of those things, I can't answer that question. Make sense? Okay. But, if we, uh, but I'm happy to do it. Well, it's because we went to school for eight or ten years to learn why. So, I, I'm happy to I'm, I'm happy to provide a little tutorial later. Okay. So the other thing is the other thing people look at on the label is the guaranteed analysis, right? And you've probably seen some of these things. Crude protein, crude fat, crude fiber, crude moisture. The word crude is so appropriate in that terminology. This comes from an analytical system developed in the 19th century for dairy cattle in Switzerland. And we're still stuck with it. Okay? And then there's all of this other stuff that, of course, in the 1800s, they didn't even know existed. And this is all marketing. All it is. Right? First of all, because, uh, well, first of all, it's uninterpretable on its face. And the second is because just because they put it on there and somebody else does it doesn't mean it's not in everybody, uh, in everybody else's foods. It, and, and notice that they've got ascorbic acid on here, which, is, which if that's not marketing, such doesn't exist. What's the, what's the ascorbic acid requirement of the cat? Zero. Zero. <laughs> right. It's made in the liver. We even tested that in cats with liver disease, and they still had plenty of it, for goodness sakes. So there's a delusion. It's in there as an antioxidant, along with lots of other things, probably. But anyway. So this is all just marketing because according to AFCO, the only thing you need is maximum of fiber and moisture because those are the cheap ingredients, minimums of protein and fat because those are the expensive um, ingredients, nutrients. Okay? So that's that. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. So you showed us the, the ideal protein percentage um, at which you know, it's around five grams per kilo per day. Right. How would you interpret that to that crude protein? Is there a way to yes, and I, show, I went through a slide fairly quickly. I said if they're eating this much, they need a label that says this on it. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, and so what I tell veterinarians is do a diet history on every animal you see. And after a while, you're going to start hearing the same <coughs> foods over and over again, and you're going to know what's fed in your area, and you know how to evaluate animals. Are they doing okay? And after a while, you're going to find out what, you know, what works in your area. And the area, I mean, I you know, practice in a big city in, in central Ohio. And we don't see nutritional deficiencies. They are not published anywhere. So from the nutritional point of view, it's just not a problem. Okay? Um, and so what we try to do is make recommendations that more fit with what the owner is interested in doing. Um, but that's why experience is on there. OK, just a little bit on hedonics. Um, which is not studied. I mean, it's studied by some people. The pet food companies certainly study it. They don't publish a lot on it, so we don't know a lot of those kinds of things. But certainly, these all influence um, cat's behavior. And the, the reason I have choice up there, let me see what I've got next. Uh, oh, yeah, good choice. So, particularly with a captive animal, I don't have any idea what that animal wants to eat. Okay? My preference is to ask it. And the, way, and the way we ask it, and I'd be interested in feedback from people here, is that we always offer new diets in a separate container at mealtime next to the usual food, preferably on a non-work day, so the owner can sit around and see what's going on. Uh, and then let the cat choose. Question. So that goes back to my previous question, because what I've been told by uh, dog trainers is that animals will go to the food that is closest to them. That's what's oh, I see. So the proximal choices. Oh, oh, that's how you mean by oh, oh. No, but those are all well. In in those studies, that was all controlled for, no question about it. Yeah. In these studies, I haven't got any idea. I think animals tend to choose what they want, and I don't know a thing about dog proximity control. I'd have to read that literature to be able to help you interpret it, if there is one. I mean, it wasn't given to me in literature. Yeah. It was given to me by Gene Donaldson told me that. Yeah. Then I'd ask for the, for the paper or where it's been studied, and it probably has, I and mean, the behaviors are probably where it's been studied. I'm not, so it's a fair question. But, 
when you do this, I mean, it's been my experience that if cats like one or the other, they will tell you like immediately. I don't think this is very, this isn't rocket science. Um, and a lot of cats are neophobic of new food. Ah, so the question, thank you. Thank you. I think, and I think I got a slide on that. Uh, maybe not. But anyway, I'll just take it up right now because we're running out of time. The question was, are cats neophobic about new foods? What's the survival van uh, value of being neophobic about a new food? There's none. When are individuals neophobic? When they're ill. When they're, when they're ill? Good. Where else? Stress. When they're threatened. Absolutely. And so to me, when people say my cat's a really finicky eater, and I'll show you a little bit of data on that, I want to know what's going on in the environment and why it is. Because cats in enriched environments aren't, in my experience. Because in my experience, I often, I, I train cats, mm -hmm. so I often present novel food to them, mm -hmm. and they often will refuse it for a, quite a bit at first, and then it takes a lot of coaxing and encouragement to get them to try new food, even if it's very smelly. We can talk about that later. Yeah, okay. Because that may be a special case, I don't know. Because I don't know enough about your practice. Okay. So anyway, so, um, and so we don't mix foods, we don't take, out, take away the old food, those kinds of things, because those could be perceived as threats. <coughs> and when, we've seen animals that uh, act that way. Um, so that's that. The other thing that we don't think so much about is, yeah, I like this one. Uh, hi. Uh, <laughs> We've already, and we've talked about some of, we've, we've talked about some of these, I mean, no, no, this is, this is the same slide with the answers. So how much do you feed in adults to a body condition score of three out of five? How often? You know, whatever works in the situation for the animal. Um, uh, when, whatever's comfortable. One of the things about feeding multiple meals that some people don't think about is the meals don't all have to be the same size. Yeah. So, uh, and owners don't get that. Honestly, until you ask them about their own feeding behavior and say, are all your meals exactly the same size? No. Well, okay, good. We can work with that. Where you want them in a safe place so the dog isn't coming in, so that they're not competing with other, you, you know all of this. They're not next to machinery that's going to come on, those kinds of things. Um, it's a great set of videos on the, uh, from the 40s about how you can scare cats into not eating. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then, um, uh, how, and this is something that's already been mentioned, so I won't take much time to talk about it, but, uh, oh, I just want to stick this in, is that I'm not a huge fan of, just to give you an idea of how potent pet food marketing is, right? What is marketed to owners for their cats? Treats. How often are they supposed to feed them? All the time, right. Those aren't treats, they're snacks, okay? <laughs> Snacks are foods ingested between major meals. Treats are things that bring joy, right? Which means there's a whole lot of things that will bring joy that is not food, okay? So just a small personal issue. Um, anyway, but feeding enrichment, we talk, uh, some people have already talked about that. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, feeding enrichment because, I'm, because I work with zoo animals, and so feeding enrichment is very important in, in zoos. And to the, there's all different kinds. You can, and you know, hope you get, get rid of the bowl. And when I do what I'm talking, when I'm talking to clients, is that I will go. You know, you, just, you can you can just Google uh, uh, food puzzles, cats. Click on images, and it'll just fill the screen. There's things that move. There's things that don't move. There's things you can make yourself. There's things you can spend a lot of money on. There's all kinds of things. And so I want the client to choose. Okay. The reason is they know their cat better than I do. They know their situation better than I do. They know their own preferences better than I do. And if I choose and it doesn't work, guess what? Mm -hmm. I'm wrong. Right? I've damaged that therapeutic relationship. Where if they choose and it doesn't work, we can say, well, remember, there's all kinds of them. Let's try something else. Okay? So I really try to avoid having clients say to me, yes, but. Okay? Because that just means that I haven't done a good job of finding out what the situation is. Because you know that yes, but is an acronym. Stands for your evaluation sucks, behold the underlying truth. <laughs> and, and so I used to say, well, I clearly don't understand everything that's going on. Help me here. Okay. Um, let's see. And so this will look familiar to you. I don't know, other, you may have other protocols for this. Food puzzles haven't been studied near as much as I wish they were in, uh, in, in client-owned cats. There's so just a little bit of work, but 
it, it, would, be, um, it would be very nice to have a, uh, a protocol as detailed and as, as well tested as the negative reinforcement protocol we were talking about just briefly. And again, it'll be individual. Well, we know that, but I think there, I'm hoping that there's some best practices. And if those of you that work with these all the time have developed those, I encourage you to publish them. Um, because uh, one of the things that I heard before, uh, that I heard is well, how many of you go into people's homes to have a look around? Yeah, see, veterinarians don't, and we really need that. And, and what you guys could help everybody out a whole lot is to develop and validate some kind of instrument for looking around the house that could then be used by people who couldn't go in. But the thing is, and, and we've got instruments on our website that I, I'll show you this afternoon, but the thing is, we never, I mean, they're just, they're just conversation tools. They're not validated instruments, but it would be extraordinarily helpful because veterinarians, trust me, are not, gonna, are, are not all going to start going into people's houses for lots of reasons, that some of which are good. Okay? <laughs> but, but being able to get a better picture from the owner of what was going on in that house would be extraordinarily valuable. And if anybody wants to do that, I'll help you. And I've got, a, I've got a really bad form that you can start beating up on. I don't care So about that. But it would be a very nice thing to have a validated form. Yeah? Um, well, I know Melinda Demartini Price, who works with separation anxiety dogs, does a mostly remote practice. And so she's developed a lot of information at a technology conference that was recently in the Bay Area. She talked extensively about seeing in the client's home without ever actually having to go there. And one of the tools she recommended was using a drop cam. Okay, maybe you can come talk to me about that afterwards. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so I told you I'd demonstrate my ignorance over and over again. Um, and then I also think that, uh, um, we're almost out of time, I also li always like to try to feed what both the owner and the cat like. And there's a, some delusion about lower, from lower urinary tract, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that this afternoon, about that these cats need more water. And, well, some owners just hate canned food. And since we're dealing with a threat-responsive disease, if I tell the owner to do something they don't want to do, and they go home and impose it on their, uh, and, and, and impose it in their situation, that just doesn't sound to me like a good strategy. Particularly since there is absolutely no evidence that it makes a bit of difference. Okay? People like it, they want to do it, okay. Um, but if they both like it, if both, and so I always ask the owner, you okay with that? And then I wait 100 milliseconds, watch the look that passes across their face, and then I know whether they're okay with it, and my conversation proceeds apace. But if they said they're fine, then I'll offer it to the cat in the way I just said. Okay. Please. The whole kibble versus wet food thing, I have been told repeatedly, actually by one of your ex-students, Mark Schmidt, that the, um, the, the evidence was that kibble was hard on the digestion. There's nothing in nature that's as hard as kibble, uh, that it would be dehydrating, and therefore wet food avoided all of these problems. So forget the kibble and stick with just the wet food. So the question, so the question which was, I think, <laughs> tangentially <laughs> related to me, because she heard it from one of my students, <laughs> was you shouldn't feed kibble because it's, because it's bad. That's a delusion, okay? There's absolutely no evidence in support of that proposition and massive evidence to the contrary. We're feeding 85 million cats in the United States a day. The majority of them are eating, canned, uh, are eating dry food and they're living to 20 years old. What kind of evidence do you want? Because it was marketing because uh, kibble did not spoil. It was for the consumer's uh, convenience and nothing. Well, that's all true. Th th that's also true, but that doesn't negate anything else that I said, right? right? Just, because, you know, just because Ford's going to make money if you buy a car doesn't mean they're bad people for selling you a car. You know, so anyway. Yeah, that, there's no evidence in support of that. Like I said, the, and the whole dehydrating thing is just an ignorance of the literature and of basic physiology. So, um, and that's all well published. And, 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 and so, um, what else? Oh, we've talked about, well, here's what it was, because you were talking about neophilia and neophobia. So, in situations where I'm working with clients, the, the, uh, the, they're talking about the cat being neophobic or finicky eating. I want to know if they're doing that for, if there's something, there's uh, some threat in the environment. And the reason I want to know that, well, this is part of it, I'll show you two reasons of it. First of all, the, they can, what happens when, when, uh, when individuals are exposed to threat is that mild threat tends to increase food intake, 
more severe threat tends to reduce it. Most of you, you know, during finals week, everybody, you know, eats a little too much and stuff because you're anxious and then things get, get, get better. But you scare, most, most, most animals, when they're scared enough, stop, tend to stop eating or eat only very familiar foods and, and, and develop neophobia and all that. And so this is one side when animals overeat. The, Frank had a nice paper on that uh, a few years ago, which I think was in veterinary behavior. Um, anyway, and this is from our, own, uh, from our own research in the colony of cats that we've studied with, uh, with lower urinary tract problems that I will um, talk more about this afternoon, but, and I'll just, in the interest of time, finish on this. And that is that, uh, notice that this is, the orange bars here are food intake, so reduction in food intake. The yellow bars are voiding outside the litter box, and the uh, red bars are something coming up out of the mouth. Um, food bile or hair. And what we found is that when these animals were stressed, male cats would stop using the litter box, but, they, um, but they'd still continue to eat. Female cats reduced their food intake significantly, and as soon as the stressor, and, and these stressors were naturalistic ones, like the air conditioner went off, excuse me, the technician went on vacation, those kinds of things. Uh, and when those are resolved, the cats went quickly back to normal. These were both healthy cats and affected cats. And so as a veterinarian, three of the most common things we see cats about are what? Changes in food intake, changes in voiding behavior, and changes in upper gastrointestinal tract behavior. And we've just documented that all of those can be a response to threat. So we've just added something to the differential diagnosis. The cure for which is to enrich environments, take that out of the equation, and then you're more likely to have something else going on. What else? So, oh, good, we're done. Um, so <laughs> cats are captive carnivores. Um, I hope I've left you with the idea that they're pretty adaptable animals. And, and fairly, well, you already knew that they were interesting animals. I think feeding is an enrichment opportunity. Um, we've got a huge opportunity for education of owners about normal, particularly captive cat behavior. And the uh, environmental enrichment can en enrich the cats and the owners health and welfare, so I'm a big fan of that. Okay, thank you.